Hey everybody, welcome to Rollback. Rollback is my way of introducing powerful, enlightening, and evergreen conversations from the prehistoric pre-video days of the podcast right here on YouTube for the very first time. Conversations like this one from July of 2015 with former NFL star David Carter, AKA the 300 pound vegan. Like most athletes, David grew up eating tons of meat, fully adhering to the conventional mythology that in order to become muscle, you must consume muscle. But as his career matured, David became plagued by a variety of persistent chronic injuries, including arthritis and tendonitis, ailments he simply could not overcome that left him sidelined despite the best sports medicine and rehabilitative resources of the NFL at his disposal. And so through a series of rather improbable events in February of 2014, David made this rather radical and quite controversial decision, which was to adopt a 100% plant-based diet. As a result, to the great surprise of his coaches, his trainers, his teammates, every single one of those nagging persistent injuries mysteriously corrected themselves and ultimately vanished altogether. All his numbers in the weight room went up. He found himself quicker, more agile, and more responsive than ever. And perhaps most important to David, no living thing had to die in order for him to thrive. It's a truly special exchange with an exceptional human being that explores a typical day in the life of the NFL. It's a peek into the typical NFL diet what he eats now on a daily basis, and tons more. I sincerely hope you enjoy our discussion and look forward to your thoughts in the comments section below. So are you writing a book right now? We're getting ready to start writing a cookbook. Oh, are also. you? Yeah, because we're, we're working with lighter and all that stuff. So we'll talk about it later. Yeah, we could talk about it now. No, I was just like, oh, don't want to use all the questions. Up. No, it's cool. We're already rolling, man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We could edit it out if you want to. but no, uh, that's fine. Yeah, man, that's exciting, a cookbook, huh? Yeah, we're, uh, you know, a lot of people are asking a lot of questions like, you know, what are you eating? Uh, where, where can I get my protein from? How the hell are you getting 10,000 calories in a day? Or mm-hmm. I, I eat like, well, I eat like 300 plus grams of protein a day. They're like, how are you getting that on a vegan diet? Mm-hmm. So it only makes sense to put a yeah, vegan, of course. vegan cookbook out there. Well, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but we just had a cookbook that just came out. Yeah. I'll give you guys a copy of it. Oh, awesome. you leave. Don't let me forget. Yeah, because I was going to run out and get one. I, <laughs> I got one with it. your name on it. Hey. Cool, man. Well, uh, thanks for uh, making the time to come on over here and do this. Thanks, man. I appreciate you having me on the show. It means a lot. Oh, cool. Well, I've been following uh, your journey from afar uh, for a while, and it's quite an inspiring story. It's a unique story, and I think it's uh, it's an important story. I mean, there's a lot of similarities in our journey and, and you know, some distinct differences as well, and I kind of want to get into all of it, man. But uh I think the best way to just kick it off is like, let's just go back to the beginning, dude. Like, where does where does football start with you? Where'd you grow up? Like, how did you kind of, uh, you know, blaze this path into becoming a college football player and beyond into the NFL? Oh, okay. Well, uh, you're taking it way back. Yeah, huh? it's way back. <laughs> well, let's set the stage. All right. Well, um, well, I have a brother, and we both play football. Um, so we started in high school. Well, we started in Pop Warner, like five. You grew, then, out, you grew up out here? Yeah, grew up in Los Angeles. Should have mm-hmm. said that. I'm a Los Angeles native. Grew up in uh, southern Los Angeles. Uh, my brother, I have a sister, and my two parents. And uh, so my brother and I started playing Pop Warner football at Crenshaw High School. It's a Pop Warner team. And mm-hmm. we were, you know, defensive linemen there and then on to high school and, you know, the basics. Mm-hmm. College, I went to UCLA. Uh, Did you have a good high school football team? Yeah, we were to, we we won. We were pretty good. We went. Uh, we won the. I mean, it was a long time ago. Hard for me to remember. Uh, oh come on, man! What are you? Twenty six. Twenty seven. Twenty seven. You're literally half my age, almost. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. All right, come on, man. But uh, we were with uh, Kaiser High School. We had a pretty good football team. My mm-hmm. brother and I, we were known as the bookends. I played one the uh, the left defensive end, the strong side defensive end. My brother played the right side defensive end, and we went to win on a lot of games. We were like 10 and 12, 
Mm. So that's pretty good. We didn't win the championship, but that's pretty damn good, you know. Mm-hmm. And what's what's he doing now? He's in the NFL too. Oh, he is. Yeah. I didn't know that. Man. <laughs> yeah. Wow, who's he play with? Uh, right now, he's a free agent, I think. So you he think he, you know what your brother? You don't know what your he brother just, plays for? <laughs> unless he just got signed, was, but unless he just got signed, but uh, yeah, he's he went on. He played with the Steelers for two years, with the Colts one year, at the Bengals another year. So we both actually got drafted at the same time. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, we were both the, playing both defensive linemen. Yeah, he was a defensive end. I was a defense uh, interior defensive lineman, mm-hmm. and uh, we actually got drafted on the same day. We we're the first brothers to get drafted on wow. the same day in the NFL. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. So hold on, he's wait, he's older or he's younger? He's younger than me. He's younger, but in college, so, you red shirt. I had a red shirt year because I wasn't big enough. I was like two fifty, two six, uh, two sixty in college my freshman year so uh they were like oh yeah you got a red shirt and a red shirt a year and then yeah but he didn't have to red shirt because he was playing a smaller position like an outside linebacker right. defensive end position did he go to ucla also no he went to fresno state mm-hmm. so he went he did pretty well that's know? pretty special man so uh i mean are, are your parents still around yeah, yeah. Still, uh, yeah, so that must have been a big moment for them. Both their both their sons getting drafted on the same day. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, they're pretty excited. Yeah, and there are a couple cool. people passed out in the draft party, like, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> 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 they both got drafted at the same time!" Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So, all right. So, uh, so you're playing at UCLA, and <clears throat> I mean, did you have a sense that uh, you know you were headed for the for the big show? I mean, was that? I mean, obviously, that's you know your dream right i mean was yeah. it looking like it was gonna work out or how did how does that all play out uh you know i didn't i didn't know if i was gonna get drafted to the league but i did pretty well my senior year junior senior year and ended up going in the uh, fifth round mm-hmm. uh, sixth round Sixth round. He's looking sixth at his round. wife. <laughs> she keeps the stats yeah sixth round <laughs> my brother went fifth round and uh-huh. i went sixth round and but um yeah and i ended up doing well after uh, college, I, you know, played defensive end and interior tackle. When I got to the league, I got drafted sixth round. They were like, oh, he's not, mm-hmm. you know, sixth round draft. They didn't think I was going to last too long, but I ended up starting my uh, my rookie year. Oh, you did at the Cardinals. At the Arizona Cardinals mm-hmm. at nose tackle. And I was undersized. Most defensive uh, nose tackles are like 340 pounds. And I was 300 right. starting at the. In, in what do you what do you attribute that to? I mean, did you have some kind of extra speed or agility? Or? Yeah, I was quick. I'm yeah. I'm very quick for my size. I wasn't vegan then. At the, yeah, but, I know. We're gonna get into that. Don't worry. <laughs> but uh, very quick for my size, and I did and, and very strong, and I, I did very well. And made a lot of plays, a lot of stats. Uh huh. So yeah, my first sack was uh, was Manning and the Giants. Wow. And so yeah, that's pretty good. How many games in was that? I don't remember what game that was. <laughs> Paige, Paige might know. Paige, do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> How long have you guys been together? Oh, wow. Since before, it's like sophomore year of college. Oh, nice. Yeah. College sweethearts. Yeah. So like it's it, been man. a long time. Yeah. And you've been kind of a, a journeyman in the NFL. I mean, you played for a bunch of teams. You played for the Cardinals and then the Cowboys and then the Raiders and then the Jaguars, right? So you have yeah. a pretty good sense for how the NFL functions, for how these various teams operate and, mm-hmm. you know, kind of... Um, you know, what the NFL is all about. And I'm interested as somebody who, you know, you know, I watch football. I don't watch a ton of football, but, you know, I just see it on television. I don't know that many guys that, that play in the NFL. Uh, and I think it would be, you know, I'd love to know a little bit about, you know, what, what a real, like, day in the life of an NFL player is. Because I think we have this um, perhaps, uh, you know, kind of hyper... Uh, perhaps exaggerated sense of like how sexy it is and it's just sort of like all fly and you're all up in the club and throwing money around and everybody's <laughs> living in a huge mansion driving a Ferrari you know what I mean I think yeah. that's like sort of a conventional idea of the typical football player I mean but what is it really like well it is you're right it is kind of sexy but uh it is is hard work at the same time you know you're 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 working all day, working out all day. Like you sit, a lot of people sit behind the desk all day and work. You're working out all day, every day. You wake up at, you know, your workout started like five o'clock in the morning, and then you have like four hours of meetings and watching mm-hmm. film and studying your opponent and learning plays. And the playbooks are 
the playbooks are thicker than like calculus textbooks and they're huge and you have to remember all those plays otherwise you're not playing and so it's very um it's it is a lot of hard work and then not to mention the the beating that you're taking all day when you're mm-hmm. working when you're working out I'm talking about working out I'm talking about practices and practices are practices are hard they're tedious and they're a lot of stress on the body you're going up say for example in my position the defensive line you're going up against two other guys that are your size or bigger and uh you know you're doing that all day every day and then after that you have to rehab and you know how that goes mm-hmm. after after so you're you're trying to you know reset bones that have been like knocked out of place. You have to go to the chiropractor, or you have to stretch out muscles that have been sprained or they're bruised, and you got it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> yeah, 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 I think you said in one of your posts or somewhere on your website that every day of practice is like being in a sixty mile an hour car crash. Yeah, man, that's uh, that's definitely true, and you feel it. And you feel it in your joints and. All that stuff. A lot of guys end up having like tendonitis and all that just from the constant banging. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, you're never. It's it's never like you wake up and feel good, right? There's always something yeah. that's off, or a pain, or a little niggle, or an injury at, yeah. the, at the very minimum, right? At the very minimum. A lot of guys get really good at uh, kind of just like phasing, like tuning it out of their mind. Like, oh, uh, it's not pain. It's you know, what's what's really pain? Are you bleeding? Right. Can you walk? And you're not hurt. Right, right, right. <laughs> you just sore, but really you have a slip disc or something like that. Yeah. And uh, it, it, and I would imagine along with that, you know, there's all the pressure of like trying to hold on to your job, right? Like, so you're not going to necessarily be forthright about something that's bugging you. I mean, you don't want to create the perception that yeah. you know you're injured. No, definitely not, because the team will use that against you if you're if you're injured or something like that. Uh, like for example, this is a perfect example. Um, team doctors, you know, you you go to a doctor to get help, you know, and have them look at you and tell you, you know what's wrong and how to fix it. But the doctors don't work for you. The yeah, doctor, there, there's no like <laughs> privilege, right? They go right to the coach. Yeah, the doctors yeah. work for the team. So if you tell them, you know, if something's wrong with you, they're not going to help you. Be like, all right, man, don't worry about it. He'll get back out. You're going you're going to be good. Like, no, they're going to tell the coaches. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, if it's like, he's on, he's on the out. Yeah, get him out of there. Mm-hmm. And and that's how that works. So yeah, you know, like you gotta you gotta. It's a it's very political. It's a game. It's a chess game, and you have to know how to play it. Mm-hmm. Definitely. What are some of the political mistakes that maybe you made early on that you learned from mm. in kind of navigating, you know, how the teams function and how you relate to the coach? Mm. Political mistakes. I don't know about political mistakes, but or just maybe things you witnessed or observed oh. along the way. Political mistakes. This or not mistakes. Yeah, political things. Uh, for example, uh, guys who get the big contracts. They can do no wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, I've seen a guy, uh, like, I don't know, I don't know, a guy spitting another guy's face or something like that, or try to knock another guy who's who's got so much money. You know, the guy who's got all the money try to knock another guy off of the off. Of, you know, hurt him. Mm-hmm. The coach sees it. They can't. They don't do anything about it because. You know the guys You're are too invested in that guy. Yeah, too invested in that guy. So, and, and that's a, you know it's an investment. That's their they pay that guy a hundred million dollars. They're not going to get rid of him. They're going to get rid of the guy who is you know who's trying to come up and take that guy's job. They'll trade him. That's another thing. If someone's doing really well, they pay the guy a hundred million dollars. They're not going to get rid of the guy who's got a hundred million dollars. Mm-hmm. They're going to get rid of that guy. Mm-hmm. The guy who's up and coming. Right. And after playing under, you know, a variety of different NFL coaches, what would you, how would you characterize, <clears throat> you know, the better coaches? Like, what is it that the better coaches are doing that the other coaches aren't? Like, how would you qualify, you know, a great coach from an average coach? A great coach allows uh, the players to, to play, you know, if someone, the best person's going to play. Yeah, on any team, you're going to have that where, you know, the guy who's got the $100 million contract is going to play. But the good coaches find a place for someone to play. And they 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 keep it simple for the players to, to do what they got to do. Because when you're out there flying around at 100 miles an hour, you know, you're not trying to think. You're just trying to act and you're trying to make moves to make things happen. And uh, the coaches realize what's going on. They understand the dynamic of the team. They know how to... Uh, 
that's one that's a really important thing. They know how to to keep a team, a team. You know, it starts you have to make it like a family first, a friendship. Mm -hmm. A lot of coaches like to make it so competitive that there's so much tension in the locker room and on the field uh, trying to compete for positions that, you know, guys are just stressed out and you can't you can't yeah. operate under it those under, conditions. It undermines the bigger goal, which is the team winning, right? Definitely. Yeah, I had uh, <clears throat> this guy, Michael Gervais, on the podcast. He's a sports psychologist who works with Pete Carroll and the, and the Seahawks. And mm -hmm. he was talking about, like, Pete brought him on to help create, you know, a positive team-oriented environment and also to instill practices of mindfulness and visualization and meditation, which I know mm -hmm. are things that, that you practice and are into, um, but maybe are, uh, you know, slightly off kilter for the average football player. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting talking to him because he, he, you know, he talked about how, you know, basically his goal was to create an environment where each player could, could bring out the best in them. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's about overcoming that kind of inherent competitiveness where everybody's worried about their job to create kind of, you know, a unity around the larger goal. Exactly. And you know, they've been really successful with that, right? Yeah, sort of like games. take that recipe and like repeat that, you yeah. know? I like, I like Pete, man. He, like you said, he's, he's very, you're not supposed to say that as a UCLA guy. I know, man, but <laughs> I know I get, I just, I thought about that before I said Don't it. Worry, no one's <laughs> listening. I had to say it, but he, Hey, he won, he wins games. And like you said, he's an SC coach, old SC coach. Mm -hmm. He beat us when I was, when I was at UCLA, mm -hmm. but he wins games, and every single player that I've met and I know that's played under him, they love that guy. And uh, you know, he he makes it. He sets an environment where it's where people can want to come to work every day, and they want to come work out, and, and they want to play their hardest and put their neck on the line for him. And uh, you know, that's how you win games. And you don't have to create like a super competitive environment because guys already know that their jobs are on the line, and they know that they're trying to beat the next man. Mm -hmm. So. You know that. That's why I respect the way he's the way he coaches and what he's doing. And then I, you know, I love it, man. I shoot. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not a zero sum game, right? Like, if your approach as a player is to say, "I'm going to play my heart out, but I'm also going to do my best to bring out the best in the guy standing right next to me, or mm -hmm. you know, my teammate who's you know right to my left or my right," mm -hmm. uh, everybody wins. Yeah. But you know, the human psyche doesn't always operate that way. Yeah, you know, it should. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And how did you, you know, kind of handle the mental aspects of, of having, you know, of, of kind of bouncing around from a bunch of different teams and having to relocate and all of that? Like, how did that go for you? It's stressful, but, you know, that's like, again, that's part of the game. That's a job, right? Yeah. So you just got to kind of roll with the punches and, and prepare and, and be just, you know, as prepared as you possibly can. Um, you know, we don't buy a home anywhere. We just rent. And, you know, now we're setting up a home where we are now. But, mm -hmm. you know, you just got to kind of just stay on your toes and be ready to move. But, you know, that's how the game goes. Right, right, right. Yeah. So walk me through the uh, the typical diet pre-vegan <laughs> as an NFL player. Oh, man. All right. I know you love you love your barbecue, and that's what you grew up on. Yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. I grew up at a barbecue restaurant my family owned. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and we had a farm. And we were in a farm. Yeah, my grandpa would go out there and wring the chicken's neck, and then we would eat it for breakfast. Wow, where's the farm? It was in Oklahoma, and my aunt owned it. We would drive out every summer and go out there and and spend the summer in Oklahoma. And yeah, it was it was crazy. A total one eighty from, uh -huh. <laughs> from what I am now. But the the pregame diet, it was just kind of just basically. I didn't know anything about nutrition before being vegan, but. Mm -hmm. It was just basically eat whatever, man. If people were, I was eating ice cream. Most people do that. Just, that's actually, as a matter of fact, the night before the game, we stay in a hotel. The team serves hot wings and spaghetti, oily meat sauce, and all that mm -hmm. stuff, and all kind of crap. And, and like I said, like ice cream shakes, that's the worst thing you can have before a game, <laughs> like, right? Like, would you ever drink that before <laughs> a, a, the night before no. a marathon? Like, uh -uh. no. But. You know, that's that's the pregame. And then uh, the day before, I mean, the day of, it's, you know, pasta and super dry steak. And it's been like that on every team. Mm -hmm. Pasta and super dry steak, like you, like, it's so hard to cut. <laughs> but right. it's, And like A1 steak sauce. And then you go out there and you play, you play your game. But mm -hmm. And then during the week when you're just training, similar, <laughs> like a, ver a version of that. Yeah, during the week, like... Uh, for example, when I was on the Cardinals, I forget the name of the restaurant they had catering in, but it was, or we would get like Papados. They, they would have catering. Papados mm -hmm. is all like uh, fried shrimp and fried 
uh, alligator and fried fried everything. Everything is fried. There's, there's team nutritionists, right? Yeah, but... They're bringing in fried food. I mean, I, it doesn't matter if you're like whatever diet you're on. Everybody pretty much agrees that a bunch of fried food is no good. You guys are professional athletes. Yeah. And then there's some teams that, you know, the nutritionist actually, you know, the nutritionist does what they're, what they're supposed to do. And the nutritionist bring in like a lot of fruits and veggies, but then they bring in like yogurt and all that stuff. And, and I'm being a vegan, I'm against all that. But, you know, people think that that's what you're supposed to have and that's mm-hmm. good for you and all that. And that's, it's really bad for you. And it's, hurting you it's amazing that at that level you know of professional sports that that's kind of how it functions you know i just was at uh a couple months ago i went and spoke at the olympic training center i spent a couple days there and in the cafeteria at the olympic training center in colorado springs where you know all the top athletes and all these olympic sports come and train the cafeteria it's just you know unlimited soda unlimited soft serve ice yeah. cream like all this junk food and i was like what is going on like if anything like this should be the place where at least there's an opportunity where you have these athletes that are you know kind of you know cloistered in this place for a short period of time you could educate them and, you know, i'm not saying like you know you and i are plant based but at least you know get rid of the soda and the crappy you know processed food yeah but you know what when it comes down to is where is their money coming from yeah, you know, well, Coke is like McDonald's is the number one sponsor of the Olympics, right? Right. So, right, and McDonald's is also <laughs> in hospitals, and like they're, they're paying hospitals too. And McDonald's, all right, let's not get yeah. into that. We can get into that. Man. <laughs> I know. I talk about that stuff all the time, but yeah, yeah, you and I know what's up with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, so uh, so the latest team that you're on uh, is the Jaguars, right? And right. and so when when was that? Was like that was last year. half ago? Yeah, yeah, that was last year. And then it ended, man, with a running back hit me in the knee, psh, popped my knee really bad, uh, torn MCL, and then I rehabbed on that. But I healed pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. So, but right now, but you know, that's got me in spot right now. I'm a free agent, and mm-hmm. you know, I'm just waiting for camp to start, and then I'm going to get on the team during camp. At, so, uh, for the Jaguars. Well, for whatever team if calls. Go, I see. Because that's All how right. it goes. Like so you're just waiting for you're waiting for your agent to call you. Yeah, basically. But, yeah, but I did really well when I. Uh, when I was with the Jags, so I put up some good numbers and show some good film and all that stuff. So, it, you know, it's looking it's looking really good right now. So. Yeah, I want to get into that in a little bit more detail because there's kind of an interesting story there that relates to, um, you know, this lifestyle shift that that you yeah, have strong. embraced. So, uh, you know, where does that begin? I know Paige is a longtime vegan, mm-hmm. veg- vegetarian, vegan, Paige. Vegan. What's vegetarian, that? vegetarian, and then shift to vegan. Uh huh. So, so, Paige, were you vegetarian in college? Yeah. Our first you were. Uh, yeah. First year, she was a meat eater, and she read a uh, skinny. The book's title is called Skinny Bitch. Yeah, Skinny Bitch. Right. Well, it's a good book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, I know the book. Yeah, yeah, Rory Friedman. Yeah, and that was that kind of kick started everything and everything. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and but but you know this is I mean you're playing ball like. Yeah. That's that's cool for her, but like that's not going to be your trip. Yeah, man. I was like, man, you can forget that. I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. right. You want me to throw? You don't. You drink? cannot afford to be a skinny bitch. Right. I can't be. That's no the opposite bitch. of what you're trying to do. <laughs> exactly. That's funny. Huh? Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, man. So um, she went vegan. Like I said, I was like, okay, good job. You know, you can do that by yourself. I'm gonna still keep eating this meat and keep eating chicken. I was eating like four pieces of chicken in one setting, and you know huge 84 ounce steaks and all that stuff we would go out to eat mm-hmm. but uh and in college you were pushing what like 260 two, no that's my freshman year freshman college. year uh-huh. at the senior, senior, senior year of college i was like 305 okay so but uh yeah man i was just eating eating whatever right <laughs> but uh and and you just carry that into the nfl and that's just, how you're playing and then and then something happens and then uh so got Released from the from Arizona, and then I was at the Cowboys, and I got released from there. I was I kept losing weight, and I was hurting. I had injuries; they were just piling up. I had. Well, why do you think you were losing weight? I don't know, man. I, I was like, I got, I was like two eighty five, two ninety, and I couldn't get my weight back up. But I was, I was injured. I had shoulder pain because um, an old injury was coming back from college, or I had dislocated my right shoulder. And then it was just getting, kept getting worse. And it was at the Cardinals, too. It started hurting then. That's when it started hurting. I had nerve damage in my right arm. 
I couldn't feel my index finger, middle finger, and ring finger, and part of my thumb on my mm. right hand. I couldn't like ball a fist. They had me on this huge brace, and it would come basically from my elbow all the way down to like the knuckles of my right hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, like when I would try to hit someone, I couldn't really had no power in it. It was just like a limp, and I was just playing. But I was still playing, and I was still doing well. But like well, I when said, you can't would, exert yourself, then you're not able to work out to mm -hmm. your potential, right? So yeah. I would imagine that had something to do with losing some of the muscle mass. Yeah, definitely. But uh, and then I uh, got released and from the. I finished the year out, and I it was it started. You know, after I left it alone, it started healing up and everything. But then uh, going, I went to the Cowboys, and I was playing there. Yeah, I got released from the Cowboys because I was still my weight. I couldn't get it back up again. Mm -hmm. I was stuck at 285. 290 and then I went to uh that's after I got released from the Cowboys I went to uh Raiders. And we were no I'm not, no. I'm not there yet I'm not there yet all right man. we were watching we were in Dallas so we were in our apartment and we were watching we were watching we were binge watching Netflix all the vegan uh documentaries on Netflix <laughs> what a night right <laughs> right so we were watching I, I, I take it this is Paige's idea no no it well it was mine. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a little nerd, right? I'm a nerd on the inside. But what motivated you to even want to watch those documentaries well, to yeah, begin Paige, with? Yeah, Paige. Okay. <laughs> but we were watching, uh, we were watching um, Forks Over Knives, one of the many that we watched. And um, uh, the doc was on there, and he was talking about how uh, at the time I was suffering. Let me go back. At the time I was suffering from tendinitis. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And uh, I would soak in the bathtub. And I would try to lift myself up out of the bathtub, and it felt like somebody at, would take a bat to my elbows, and I just I would like almost collapse. Mm -hmm. and the pain was so intense and so sharp, and it was tendonitis. Were you getting like injections for that, and on like a battery of meds, or yeah, I had, they were giving me not injections, but they were giving me Celebrex or Naprosyn or something like that. They were like, it's just tendonitis, it, you know, mm -hmm. it's nothing, you know, the only way you can you can get rid of that is Celebrex, and. Celebrex, man, that stuff's so bad for you. Like, I hope I don't get sued for saying that, but that stuff's so bad for you, causes heart problems and all that kind of crap. But um, anyways, and, and, and it arth wasn't doing anything. And arthritis, too, And right? arthritis. Yeah, arthritis. Yeah, arthritis, high blood pressure, probably from the medication and what I was eating. But, you know, that stuff, man, it's so At bad. At age, like, 25. Or, yes, you know. that's the most scary part, right? And I'm like, why, why the hell do I have high blood pressure, tendinitis, and arthritis, or, like, I feel like arthritis coming on. I'm 25 years old. Like, I live, like, hopefully a quarter of my life, <laughs> you right. know? So, uh, yeah, man, I'm getting out of the bathtub, and it's, like, so much pain, and elbows hurting, tendinitis, really bad. We're watching the documentary, Forks Over Knives, and the doc goes on, and he goes, uh, the, the cause of inflammation and tendonitis, people, all these people are suffering from tendonitis, is milk. And <laughs> like milk and, and meat and dairy is causing all this. It causes inflammation, inflammation. in the joints. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, wow, is it really that simple? Like, am I, is that the reason why? I was like, I need to lay off the meat. We kept watching the documentaries. Like, uh, cow, not Cowspiracy, he wasn't out yet. Um, Frankensteer. Mm -hmm. And where the meat was coming from. And we were seeing, I was seeing how they spray all the cattle with uh, pesticides and they and 80% uh, to keep the flies off of them and, and you know all that crap that's in the pesticides and 80% of antibiotics that are supposed to go to humans go to animals mm -hmm. like all the ones that FDA or whoever didn't clear they go to the animals and they feed them because they're walking around their own shit and so you know and they eat their own shit and they, they cannibalize the cows and feed them cow blood from the other cows that died and the other cows that, that died died of just natural or not natural sickness but sickness they feed them those cows so I was like man it makes sense why I'm not at you know the top of my game right now why, mm -hmm. why my tendonitis is coming on like it is or you know so after that you know I went vegan and literally like that's amazing though because i would think that at that moment you're also thinking yeah but i can't do I'm, I'm in the nfl man yeah i can't like i hear that but like if i go vegan i'm gonna lose all my muscle like how am i gonna ever stay strong how am i gonna keep the weight you're having trouble keeping the weight on as it was as, as it, was. it was i was like well first of all so I was that's like, pretty terrifying prospect or pretty ballsy yeah it, it was i was scared i was scared I was really scared, <laughs> but <laughs> I was like, you know what? I was like, man, forget it. You know, like, 
it's at the, right now it's like this. It's like if I I can go vegan or I can just suffer and like have tendonitis and probably die at like the average death of a football player is 56 years old. Mm-hmm. And most people don't know that. And that's yeah. from eating all that crap and taking is that heart disease. I mean, mostly heart, heart disease, disease right? heart disease and stroke. A lot of guys stroke. And so I was like, you know what? Forget it. I'd rather have quality of life than, you know, than keep playing and then hopefully keep playing. And then, you know, right. Just be all in bad shape. Yeah, you so, better be careful who you who you mention that to though, because they're gonna think actually you got you have like a TBI, like a traumatic brain injury. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Considering going vegan, no yeah. man, that's something's that's, wrong with this guy's head. I got big balls. That's what yeah, that is. Right. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, uh, so I did a lot of research and I, I looked up a couple of uh, bodybuilders or vegan bodybuilders. I was mm-hmm. like, that's the best place to start. I saw that the strongest man in the world, or one of the strongest men in the world, is a vegan guy out of Germany. Yeah, Patrick. Patrick Babumian. Yeah. He's a friend of mine. This guy's awesome. Have you met him yet? No, I want to. You got to meet him. He's the best. I want to fly out to Germany and see him, (laughs) get some tips from him. I was on stage with him in Toronto at the Veg Fest a couple years ago when he did that world record setting lift, 1,200 pounds for 10 meters. I saw that. I made a little video of it. Yeah. He's super cool. Yeah. The human wolverine. Yeah, he looks like him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, he was one of the guys I saw, and I was like, man, all right, well, he's not 300 pounds. He's like two, he was like 265 at the yeah, time. Yeah, but he's half, your, he's half your height. Yeah. But, and I was like, shit, if he's the strongest man, one of the strongest men in the world, I can do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I can do it. So I did more research, and then I was like, because at the time I was like, man, well, where am I going to get my protein from? I need protein. I was one of those guys. And then I was like, well, well, that just means you're pretty much everybody. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> but, right. uh, you know, as I started doing the research and I went on the uh, plant built as a, mm-hmm. a bunch of pl- uh, bodybuilders, a plant based bodybuilders. And they were cool guys. And I look, I reached out to Guacamole mm-hmm. and his and his uh, wife and they helped me out. They sent me like a Marchese. Yeah. Guacamole, yeah. Marchese. Marchese. Yeah. Marchese I can't like never say his name yeah, right. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but um but they sent me they they helped me out and they they sent me some uh some tips and kind of took it from there they sent me like a uh yeah tips and I took it from there and uh I started doing more research and learned all the plant based proteins and the were the highest forms of protein and where I can get them and then I just started from there and kind of you know turned into a, like a plant based scientist and started testing out some of the, how I can gain weight and where I, you know where I can get the most energy from all the plant based foods and all that stuff. All right, and so in the timeline, this is in the off season. Yeah, when this you're is, playing for the when you're playing for the Raiders. No, this oh, is no, when Cowboys. I was, this is when I was. Yeah, this is when the, this is when I got released from the Cowboys. Okay. In the off season, and then so I meet this. I have this trainer while I'm in Dallas. I'm training for the next season, and he's a. He's not vegan at all. A Hispanic guy, Moses Castro, out of D- out of Dallas, Texas, and uh, great trainer. No, he wasn't vegan. And I told him I was like, "Hey, man, I'm going vegan." He said, "Wait a minute, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, what are you doing, bro? You're gonna you're gonna lose all of your weight. You're gonna not mm-hmm. be strong anymore. Where are you gonna get your protein from?" And I was like, "Man, just go with me on this one, and we're gonna see what happens, right?" So we did it. I went vegan. And then I, I ended up losing weight, but I was getting stronger. Mm-hmm. I was, uh, my arms started healing up. My uh, tendonitis just started disappearing overnight. I was like, oh my gosh, like I can, I was able to like do all kind of push ups and I was doing hundreds of push ups. Uh, my bench press went up to from like, I was able, before I was, when I was hurting the tendonitis, I can only bench press like 315 mm-hmm. for like four or five, which is not a lot for me. Right. But when I went vegan, I lost weight, but my bench press went up. I lost 40 pounds in my weight, and my bench press went up to, like, 425. And then wow. it went up to 435 and 465 eventually. Wow. So Yeah, so initially you you went down to about, you probably went down to about 260, 255. 265. Yeah. Back down Did to Did you have a little moment of, like, oh, panic? Shit. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I freaked out a little bit. But then I started... Uh, I had to get back in the books and do some more research and try to figure mm-hmm. out how to, I had to boost my calories. I talked to Guacamo again. I had to boost my calories and I had to do 10,000 calories a day. Never in my life ever had to eat 10,000 calories a day mm-hmm. and not on a vegan diet. That's the hardest thing in the world. That's to a do. lot more food. Yeah. But, um, 
And your trainer, when you lost all that weight, was he trying to talk you out of it? No, he was. I told him, I said, look, man, I'm doing it. I'm feeling a lot healthier. He was seeing the, um, and he wasn't trying to change my mind because he was seeing the improvements. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he went vegan. Oh, wow. Yeah, he went vegan. He was like, he came back one day. He was like, I see all the improvements that you're making. And I'm decided I'm going vegan now. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And he's uh, now he's running like crazy. He's doing marathons and stuff. He's doing very well for himself. That's cool. So, All right. So, so you drop the weight. And the, it's sort of like you got to strip it all down and build it back up again. Mm -hmm. Right? And as you're starting to slowly put weight back on, the bench press numbers are going up. The squat numbers are going up. The tendonitis is going away. The arthritis is going away. Mm -hmm. How about the nerve damage in the arm? Nerve damage gone. The grip in my hands is is doing really. It's gone. Like I was able to uh, do more than I've ever done before. I was stronger. I felt like a Superman. I was stronger than I've ever been, even when mm -hmm. I was, you know, my healthiest in college. So it is it perfect, man. It just went away. I, the only thing I could say was vegan diet. I know I sound like a vegan spokesman. I kind of yeah. am. Well, you really. are. Yeah, I really am. <laughs> Well, what's interesting about that is that a lot of people say, especially with, um, you know, strong men and bodybuilders and, you know, kind of power lifter type guys that, that go plant based, people will say, yeah, well, he, you know, he was already big, you know, so mm -hmm. he's just using the strength that he already, he already had all that mass. He put all that mass on, mm -hmm. you know, when he was eating the way he was eating before. So it doesn't really count. Yeah. But really. with you losing the weight and then bringing it back up again, injury free. Yeah. That's, that's a different story. And a lot sexier than I was before. Yeah. You know, way sexier. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> no, just Paige, he's sexier now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, man. But yeah. It is awesome, man. Like way less body fat, I'm way more, a lot quicker than I was before. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, right? So you put the weight back on, but the lower body fat. So it's actually you actually you probably got added more muscle mass than you had before. Definitely, I, I kind of have a six pack now. Mm -hmm. I have a six, well, for three hundred and ten pounds. I'm looking really good. I'm three ten <laughs> right now. All right, well we'll get a picture of that. <laughs> put it on the website for sure for everybody to say so right on so so meanwhile you're you're waiting for the phone to ring right yeah and so. then uh the raiders call and i go i end up going to the raiders we train for that I end up going for the raiders I got my weight up to like um 290 wasn't exactly 300 but i got my weight up to 290 and um um, and hold on a second. So what's the average weight of like a defensive lineman or somebody in your position? I mean, is it is three, 300 three is like, yeah. So that's kind of like the bottom threshold. Yeah. That's like the kind of like the cutoff point. You're mm -hmm. going to try for a team you, for you to play in D line. You need to be three plus. Mm -hmm. yeah, so unless you're playing like defensive end where they're like small. Like, right. Right. Yeah. So, but, um, but I signed with the Raiders and then, um, you know, I went over there running. Uh, I was like, it was impressive. I was running with the defensive with the defensive backs and the wide receivers, and it was like they would be tired. And I'm like, "Are y'all tired? I'm right. I'm just gonna go work out some more." Uh -huh. <laughs> like I had mad energy just from, uh, you know, eat, I was eating good and doing my vegan supplements and and all that stuff, and never got tired. Right. And yeah, I think I read you were like throwing down seven minute miles. Yeah, seven minute miles at two ninety. Right. Yeah, it was impressive. It's it's very impressive actually, but. Yeah. And so are you, and you're open about the way that you're eating, right? So what are the other players saying? What's the coach saying? What's the, what are the team trainers saying? Yeah. Well, you know, the team trainers, like, they're like, you know, where are you getting your protein from? And I'm mm -hmm. like, I laughed. I didn't mean to laugh, but I laughed. <laughs> like, you can get protein anywhere, man. It's all in the, this, that, and the other, you know, showing them like it's in the peas. There's more protein in a handful of peas than there is in a full in a steak in an eight ounce steak, mm -hmm. and they're like, oh okay, and they started seeing me lifting the weights and lifting with the lifting with the big guys and lifting you know with the heaviest guys and running with the smallest guys, and they were they were over there timing me and like I caught them timing me one time they were like, and then I would go back around and run another lap because we were running laps and then they were like, and he's how heavy is he? <laughs> and then, uh -huh. and I'm running with the big, with the smaller guys. And at the end of the run, the the smaller DBs will be, you know, bending down and like uh, gasping mm -hmm. for air. And I will go and just, you know, jog and then go stretch out real quick and then go lift weights again. So it it was, and that was I, that was my first time being vegan and coming back into coming back into the, uh, being on the team. So it was really good to. That was a great feeling to have and right. to. 
to, uh, you know. And, are, are, and so are they just scratching their heads going, how is this possible? Or are they thinking, oh, you must be doing something else. It can't be the, it's can't a first. Be the diet or, you yeah. know, because yeah. it's so different than anything they've ever been exposed to. It must be, it must have been confusing for them. It's a little scary for them because, it, you know, it challenges their way of life, their whole way of life. Because, you know, every, every dude's like, I'm eating, I'm a meat eater, you know. Being a three, being a football player, you you know that's the big manly macho thing is you know eat eat steak, eat red meat, mm-hmm. protein shake. Ugh. But I'm doing it a totally different way, where you know I'm doing it on plant based, you know all that stuff, and it it challenges everything. You know, like it's to the point where football teams are sponsored by like Muscle Milk and mm-hmm. and hot wing companies and McDonald's and all that <clears> stuff. So yeah, it, it is a it's a challenge. It's a, it challenges their way of life, and it and it, they're baffled by it because it's something they've never seen before. Right. So, but but in this case, you're strong. You're injury free. You're killing it in training camp. Everyone's taking notice. Like, where does this? How does this play out for you? I mean, what? Where does this go? So, like you said, everything's going good. But um, you know, I just feel like the team didn't take so kindly to it because you know, I me mean, being vegan, like I said, it's different and it's. You know, a lot of a lot of people aren't used to that. Say a week later, the, the next Monday, I was I was gone. The team cut me. Mm. So, you know, it was just it's a new thing for you know being in my position, being three hundred pounds, and and totally obliterating idea that you can't be big and strong and not and not eat meat. It's it's different for teams, and yeah. a lot of guys were trying to were, were looking into going vegan because they weren't feeling too healthy. They weren't feeling they were the big guys. They weren't feeling their you know had back problems and stuff, and I don't think they wanted that influence on the team. You know the you know you can you should probably stop eating so much meat. You should you know the influence that uh, that resolved your arthritis and your tendonitis. That, yeah, man. that wouldn't be good. No, 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 getting healthy. Listen, man, there. you know that's the kind of unfortunate price that somebody in your position who's trying to break a paradigm has to face in order to you know kind of break the chain and open the door for, you know, the next wave of people to come through. Somebody's got to be first, you yeah. know, and yeah. sometimes the guy who's first, you know, becomes the casualty. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's fun being the, it's fun being the underdog and it's fun. It's interesting being the guy who does it first, like you said, mm-hmm. and it, you know, there's a couple guys in the NFL now, I think. Right? Well, yeah, there's uh, Riff Whalen. Tom, yeah, he's he's a cool yeah, guy. Stanford. He's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 but uh, him, Tony Gonzalez. Yeah, that's right. Is he still is he still vegan? I, I don't sure. think he's vegan anymore. Yeah. I think he's uh, he's back on chicken and other stuff. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But he he did vegan for a while, and you know that's big time to show that you can do it vegan. He was a tight end, a smaller guy, but he still did it, man. And he, mm-hmm. uh, you know, shit. One of the greatest. <laughs> yeah. And Arian Foster for a while, but I think Aaron he's Foster. not on it. Yeah, he's not either. on it anymore. But so. he still did work very well while he was on it, too. But Yeah, he seems like a cool dude, though. Yeah, he's cool. <clears throat> All right, so you get cut, and it's uh, back to the drawing board. I mean, where, where, how do you pick, that, pick up the pieces from that? Well, I just concentrated on my diet because, you know, it was still in the beginning stages of me, not diet, lifestyle. It was still in the beginning stages of me being vegan, so I was still experimenting on you know, how to get the best fuel, you know how that goes, what mm-hmm. to eat, uh, how am I going to gain all this weight, how the hell am I going to get to 10,000 calories, 300 grams of protein a day, 300 plus grams of protein a day, so that was a constant, that was a constant, ta- a, ta- or a constant task mm-hmm. in itself, so um, I did that, and I continued training, and I started working with my coach, John Blake, he's a coach out of Dallas, he coached a lot of Hall of Famers, in the defensive line position, and um, uh, we created videotapes and out to all the teams, and ended up getting signed with the Jacksonville Jaguars. And uh, you know, I did very well over there. Uh, put up some good stats in the preseason. I was there. Uh, put up some good stats, and then uh, this was last. Year. This is last season. This past season, and um, you know. Uh, it's doing very well. Team loved me. Coaches loved me. They were like, oh, you're doing great. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, they, the, and they know about the vegan thing. They know about it. They were fine with they're it. They were cool with it. They were totally mm-hmm. cool with it. See, some teams are different. Some teams are totally cool with it. Like, it's not a big deal. As a matter of fact, we had another player on the team who was vegan at that time. And Ramsey's Barton, he's a, a wide receiver guy. 
And, um, but anyway, so that must have been nice to have somebody else that you could kind of bounce ideas off of. And yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. And I was kind of, we were sharing tips back and forth and all that stuff, but, um, yeah, totally fine with it. And, and, and had a lot of, you know, like I said, a lot of good stats, a lot of good plays. Um, one of the, um, scouts came up to me and was like, man, you're doing so well right now. A lot of the teams are talking about you. There's a lot of, but there's a lot of buzz around the mm -hmm. league about you right now. So I was, you know, I was doing really good. I felt really good about what's going on. And um, then right the last preseason game, I was running, uh, scaling across the line, trying to make a tackle on the other side of the line scrimmage. I mean, on the other side of the line. And running back was about to cross the, the goal line. And I was, I had my body turned a little bit the wrong way. And running back went right into my knee. And I... Uh, I uh, tore my ACL. Mm -hmm. I was out for for <clears throat> like three months with that right there. Oh, that was man. pretty much the whole That's season. That's it, right? Yeah. So I was done for the done for the year off of that. But you know, and I got an, I healed up pretty quickly. I healed up faster than they thought I would. But by then, the season's full swing. And, right, right. Yeah. So yeah. So you have yet to have the opportunity to really show what you're capable of. Yeah, but. That's got to be sort of exciting, but also frustrating. Yeah, it's very exciting, but it is very frustrating. But I take it this way, you know, um, I have my ups and downs already. You know, like I've not already. I'm sure I'll have more, but I'd, I've done a lot of experimenting, and I feel very comfortable with where I'm at right now as far as strength goes, as far as agility goes and health, everything goes. Um, you know, um, I figured. I feel like I figured it out how to how to how to be the 300 pound vegan the whole time, like 300 pounds mm -hmm. plus all the time. Like I said, right now I'm 310. Before I was struggling to yeah. keep my weight. Is it the heaviest you've been? Yeah, that's the heaviest I've been uh -huh. nice. ever. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's hard to gain the weight at, at, as, a, as a vegan. And that was the, really the major part of the struggle. How am I going to get this mass? Mm -hmm. How am I going to get this strength up? Um, well, not really the strength. That kind of just came with it. But um, the size was the hard part. Right. So let's talk about that. Uh, you know, sort of training aspects aside, what's the typical day in the life of food for you? Like breakfast, lunch, snacks, pre-workout, post-workout, dinner? Okay. So I'm on an interesting food schedule. Uh -huh. It's nothing like yours. And the <laughs> Well, we do different things. Yeah, totally different. But um, I eat on a two, I have a timer every two hours. And my timer goes off. I'm eating. Uh -huh. Is the timer going to go off during this podcast? No, no. I'm going to eat. After I got this. a bowl of blueberries in front of you and a couple of almonds, but I feel like I should be feeding you more right now. No, I'm, I'm good right now. I'm yeah. gonna <laughs> All right. Go get a let, calorie. You just test. let me know if you get hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it. But um, yeah, to reach the ten cal ten thousand calories a day, every two hours I'm eating eating something or drinking a shake, um, and it's a lot of preparation. So in the morning. I'll have like um, berries or some kind of fruit smoothie with with a bunch of bananas. That's an um, that's another thing. I'm eating like 25 bananas a day. Mm -hmm. Not out here because it's so hard to get organic bananas out here mm -hmm. in Costa Rica where I where I train at. There's free bananas everywhere. Right. So organic, it's the greatest. So. Right, right, right. 30 bananas a day program. Yeah, and that's so many calories and carbs, which is great for uh, gaining weight. But um. Yeah, so I do that, and I do like a bowl of millet or a bowl of uh, couscous or something like that. Oat, uh, soaked oats. I soak a lot of my uh, soak a lot of my oats and and nuts and stuff because it uh, it helps with digestion and absorbing as much of the nutrients as possible. That's another thing. I'm constantly trying to figure out ways to make food as dense as possible, mm -hmm. and packed with nutrients as possible. That's where the Vitamix comes in. Oh you can yeah, just blend it all down and pack so much into it. Oh yeah, if, I, it's, if it's greens or raw vegetables or fruit or whatever, you can get so much in you so much more quickly. Yeah, I use the Vitamix like crazy. I don't, <laughs> I couldn't be vegan without the Vitamix. Right, right, right. So what? Is, so so tell me what the typical shake. What's in the typical shake? Okay, so the typical shake. Um, Everybody wants to know that, right? I know, it's right? Like, like that's a secret. I should be selling this. No, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the typical shake is. Like oats, um, what was it? Wheat germ, like I said, five bananas, mm -hmm. um, 
And this is this is like one big shake, and I just drink it down. Like I'll drink one shake and then wait ten minutes and drink another shake. Mm. But uh, I do that: five bananas, uh, coconut cream, uh, sunflower seeds, and I just kind of mix it all in there. And then I get, I try to get uh, sixty-five grams of protein per per like sixty-four ounce um, container, and that way I can get. Um, and I just drink it down half. That's 30 grams of protein. Mm-hmm. I, I drink that before a workout, and I drink the other half after a workout. And then I just, you know, I have like probably like I drink like three of those 64-ounce containers. Right, right, right. And and in terms of supplements, what, just like a plant-based protein supplement like mm-hmm. Vega or Sun Warrior or something like that? Well, I use uh, I use Vega before. I use a lot of Vega before. I use their, uh, but right now, and Health Force. Mm-hmm. I use a lot of health force, but right now I don't. I don't use much of anything being out of um, being out of the country because can't really get anything there. And that's really mm-hmm. when I put on the most of my weight, the bulk of my weight. I was using. That's a, interesting. Yeah. When you when you stop doing the powders. Yeah. When I stop doing the powders. What do you? How do you explain that? Just whole foods, man. Just yeah. dense foods and less processed foods. I'm not really a huge fan of processed right. foods. I mean, they taste good, and they're a great transition for people trying to come from, you know, the standard American diet to the, the vegan diet. But, you know, there, there's not a lot of nutrients in them, you know, but, uh, they're, but they're still very tasty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So do you, when, you, when you stopped doing all the powders, you didn't notice a difference in your ability to recover or build, yeah. build mass or put, keep weight on, put weight on? Yeah. Uh, I stopped using the powders, and... Um, and uh, once again, I lost a little bit of weight, but I put the weight back on again, uh, not, not too much weight, like 10 pounds. So I was like 290 and I was like, Oh my gosh, no, I need to get back up again. So, but I put on, I put on the weight and I was becoming more cut, more defined, uh, stronger. Um, I was doing 200 push ups a day before. And then when I started doing more whole foods, I was doing like, I was like, after my 200, I'm like, okay. I'm gonna do 300. I'm gonna do 400, and I'm doing mm. like 500 push-ups wow. a day. <laughs> like, wow. it just it's it's got a lot easier because I felt like eating the whole foods, your body can utilize the nutrients more. When you're eating so many processed foods, it's hard for your body to break that down. Your body's confused and doesn't know really what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think know. it changes your gut biome too. Yeah, definitely. So, you you know, when you're eating all the whole foods, you're propagating a certain kind of, of you know, microbiology in your gut that's mm-hmm. that acclimates to those kinds of foods, right? So you're maximizing that by only eating those. Yeah, definitely. And then, and that's another thing, speaking of gut bio, um, I were, when I went out to Costa Rica, I had the privilege of meeting Victoris Kovinskis. Mm. And he's, uh, you know who that is? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, he's awesome. But... Uh, John so, Joseph's always talking about that guy. Yeah, he's amazing. He's full of knowledge. But anyway, that's the guy who got me doing 200 push-ups a day. Uh-huh. There are 500 push-ups. He was doing 200 push-ups a day. He's 72 years old, I think. Maybe you think he's older than that. Mm-hmm. But he's got scoliosis. He's blind. And he's, <laughs> <laughs> and he's doing 200 push-ups a day. And, and I was like, and he was like, Oh yeah, David, I'm doing 200 push-ups a day. I was like, "Are you serious?" I was like, "I challenge you." I said, "Okay." <laughs> I was like, "I cannot let this 72-year-old guy beat me in uh-huh. a push-up competition." <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so now I had to double it and add an extra 100 on there. But uh-huh. anyways, wow. um back to the the gut bio or gut gut, you know, the gut science. Uh, I learned from him how to make uh probiotics. And so I've been making my own probiotics and mm. uh sauerkraut mm. and all that stuff and and a wealth of knowledge, and it's amazing how uh, if you have the 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 right probiotics, you taking them like you're supposed to be, you utilize all the the food like you're supposed to be. Your body can digest them. Right, and then those regular. nutrients become more bioavailable to you. Definitely, just passing right through you. Exactly, you have so much more energy. Skin clears up. My muscle definition uh, clears up. I mean, it clears up. It, it, the definition came about a lot better. I got bigger. I felt myself, I I started weighing myself. I was putting on like five pounds every two weeks. So it was, and it was like solid. I wasn't putting on Mm. any fat. So it was really good. Right. And what about recovery? Oh man, recovery is great. So one of my workouts is when I'm in Costa Rica is I take a bag, a big, huge burlap bag. I don't know how big it is. And I fill it up with rocks. 
And and so what I do is I take this bag and I do I, I carry it front in front of my body like this. I carry it mm-hmm. like a person and I just carry it up the hill and I do that all day and I don't never get tired and my I, like it's it's amazing. I run all day like the stuff that that used to make me tired before when I was doing a lot of the pro, like processed foods and stuff. Um, you know it. It doesn't tire me out anymore. It's like the oxygen is just free flowing in my body. I utilize oxygen a lot better. Recovery time. I don't get sore after workouts at all anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I see a lot of people post on Instagram like about how, oh yeah, on leg day. If it was leg day and the zombie attack happened, you know, I'm done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, right. But my legs never get tired, and and my legs are. I, I lift what's a lot. The, uh, what's the squat and the leg press these days? <laughs> uh, the squat. I'm squatting like. Uh, just the other day, uh, yesterday or the day before, I squatted a uh, leg press, 1,600 pounds, 10 mm-hmm. times. So it, it's... It's working out. It's working, you know, 1,600 pounds, you know. It's, <laughs> <isn't>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But yeah, yeah. but uh, squat is is like 600. So it's it's doing, I'm doing really well. Like that's some of the, the highest numbers I've ever had. So I'm really impressed with what I'm able to, to, to churn out on mm-hmm. this uh and this vegan lifestyle. Right. All right. Well, back to like the food timeline. So we're, we're through breakfast right now. Okay. So how does it work? Like snacks, lunch, pre-workout, afternoon workout, after you work out, dinner. Okay. So snack. Okay. Pre-workout. I get my workout. Pre-workout, I do uh, maca, maca powder and um, spirit, uh, like a mixture of maca powder, spirulina mm-hmm. and uh, moringa. And mm-hmm. moringa is the, that's like the super food, super fruit of all super fruits. It's like a, plays every position. Yeah. It's you know? awesome, awesome stuff. And it seems to give me a, a great energy boost before workouts and it keeps me going. And, um, cause it also has protein in it too. Right. So, but, um, it keeps me, it keeps me going, <clears throat> keeps me going for the whole workout, lots of energy. And it's like, um, so that's my pre-workout and, um, and then during the workout, I actually put spirulina in my water. That's like my little secret. I take and put water in the, in the Vitamix, put some spirulina in there, maybe a little bit of moringa, and I blend it up. And it tastes like crap, but it does yeah. it does great because you're fueling your body. You're working so hard in the gym. Well, at least me, I work so hard in the gym. My body needs some fuel, some nutrients to to kind of supplement while working out. And it does a great job. It just gives my body that protein right now that it needs right. during the workout. Spirulina is the highest protein content by weight of any food on the planet. Yeah, 60% protein. And uh, I do that in the morning too, but I'll put a little, I'll squeeze some lemon in it. To really? make it and actually it tastes a lot better if you do that. Uh-huh. Um, but it's incredible how you just immediately feel good. It's yeah. just water, spirulina, and a little lemon. And you're like, boom. Zinger. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I never talked to anybody else that did that though. So <laughs> I thought I was the only guy doing that because for most people, like it's unpalatable. Yeah, you know? it's, it's not like it tastes good. No, <laughs> yeah, no. I'm gonna have to try the lemon thing. But yeah, it does taste like like ass. But mm-hmm. Sorry for all the curse words, but yeah, that's all right, man. It's a podcast. Dude. Oh, say okay. whatever you want. All right, cool, cool. Um, all right, so that's like during workout, and then I assume like after workout, another shake. Is yeah. that what you do? So after workout, I take another shake down, probably like 500 calories because I'm lifting heavy weights. So, and I'm trying to gain weight. I don't want to just take a shake down that's going to be just enough to refuel my body. So, I mean, like just enough to barely meet my muscle mass and all that stuff. So I'm drinking uh, at least 30, or 30, not at least 30 grams because your body can only process 30 grams of protein after you work out or 25 grams of protein. So I do like 30 grams shake of protein. And then I do, uh, and then I do 500 calories of it's a combination of bananas, uh, oatmeal, um, wheat germ. Like I said, I put some flaxseed in there. I also do flaxseed before workouts mm-hmm. because that actually helps your body to burn fat, um, fat your fat energy stores for energy during the workout, prolonging your workout, making it. Uh, I have great workouts when I use flaxseed. Mm-hmm. So, um, and it also lowers your blood pressure for guys who have high blood pressure problems. And I used to have high blood pressure, so I'm always taking it. But uh, right. Is the blood pressure good now? Oh, uh, yeah. Blood pressure is fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't have any problems with it. But, um, yeah, after workout, so bananas, flaxseed, uh, oats, 
so I do soaked oats because that that they're pretty much more digestible right. that way. And uh, yeah. What about beans and legumes? That's I put, more like a dinner thing. Or I put beans in there sometimes, a lot of times. Um, in your blend. Yeah. Oh, you blend protein. them up in your drink? It's protein. Really? How, I've never done that. How's that taste? Well, I put black beans in there sometimes, and it's not very pretty. Right. <laughs> but uh, I usually do white beans or something like that. And then, you know, at least it looks nice, but it's the same amount of protein. And it's got a lot of calories, a lot of fiber in it. And that's another good thing, too. Fiber mm-hmm. is good for muscle development. A lot of people don't know that. They have fiber deficiencies, and that's why they're not building muscle. It's not, they think it's protein, but it's really you don't have enough fiber in your system. But... um yeah, so I do that. That's beans, bananas, flax, flax oats, and wheat germ. What about yeah. uh, you ever do beets? I do beets during Pre, before pre-workout, workout, pre workout, yeah, pre workout, yeah. yeah. Psh, man, dude, it's like that's crazy how much better you feel. Like you feel like you just every breath you take in is like three breaths. Yeah, definitely. I learned that from uh, Paul Shapiro. It's a good friend of mine. Uh, oh, at Humane Society? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good friend of mine. He, uh, I owe him a, a workout. He's like, I want to work out with you. Yeah. I don't know if you can hang, bro, but uh, okay. <laughs> we went to the same high school. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Small I mean, I'm world. way older than him, but uh, but I know Paul. Oh, That's yeah. That's cool. He's cool. Him and his brother. I call his, his brother like the vegan Rambo. That guy's got uh-huh. like case out against the fbi and all kind of right <laughs> yeah there it's a hardcore situation yeah i met his dad you know like grew up in a really conservative family but when he was at, like when he was in high school he had crazy dreadlocks and you know <laughs> like growing up in dc like that like that's radical you know he was always like an activist dude yeah they're cool i like them man they're great people what were we talking about we we're talking about dinner dinner oh yeah. yeah and we weren't but we are now we are now <laughs> yeah that's where we're heading yeah but uh Dinner, my one of my favorite things is a uh, gallo pinto, which is um, beans and rice. Because beans and rice comprise of a complete protein. Most people don't know that, but uh, and, and it's very filling. Plenty of carbs, plenty of calories, plenty of fiber, plenty of protein. And uh, I usually add avocado, tomato, and uh, some some. Uh, queso on there and mm-hmm. make that in the Vitamix with so the nutritional yeast, which mm-hmm. is a complete protein. And also vi- has uh, B12 in it too. Plenty of B12 for recovery and all that stuff. And, uh, and, and, uh, the cashews, uh, they help. there's so many calories. It's like, it helps mm-hmm. you to, I feel like that helps to put on so much weight with the nutritional yeast and the, and the cashews and all that stuff. We make uh, cashew cheese in the Vitamix with, with uh, nutritional yeast and cashews. Yeah. You done that? Oh, I do it all the time. Yeah, That's right. my favorite. I do well, it like every day. I, t- I know. Like, <laughs> who am I talking to? Exactly. You know, it's funny about, I mean, I could eat beans and rice every single day. I mm-hmm. pretty much do. You know, yeah. like I'm pretty simple. Like I like it. Like I could have that for dinner every night, just that with like a little avocado and some hot sauce and like, I'm good. Yeah. And when people say, oh man, you know, plant-based, so complicated, so expensive, it's like, it's so simple. Buy a huge bag of rice and a huge bag of beans, and exactly. you're out like ten bucks, and you can eat for like a month. Exactly. I don't know. That's what I mean. And it ten, takes ten minutes to make. Yeah, like expensive. Like that's like eat the fruit. poor man's I diet. I eat fruit during the day, and I'll eat that like for lunch and dinner. I, I honestly, I could like be happy with that. Yeah, yeah. As it long is. as I have a Vitamix too. But yeah, I mean, you can make anything a Vitamix. But oh, uh, sometimes I make like bean soups. Just pour a bunch of beans in there, like white beans, and then. And then put a bunch of seasonings in it, some like a pumpkin or whatever. And then it's like protein packed, like um, yam, protein beans and yams. And mm-hmm. that's like, it's sweet. Put some vanilla in there. You don't even taste the, the beans. But you, you have the yam in there. It's super sweet. It's like a Thanksgiving treat or something right. like that. It's awesome. It takes like no time to make. No time. But it's full of nutrients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So I got a pretty clear. What about desserts? I'm not a real dessert guy. No, I don't do desserts. Oh, banana and ice cream. Fruit, yeah. That's my fruit or banana and ice cream. That's mm-hmm. like, I feel like I'm eating ice cream, but I'm not. But it's just bananas. It's awesome. That's good. So, all right, I get it. Um, and I want to uh, I want to get into the whole Costa Rica thing because mm-hmm. uh, you kind of went down there with one idea of what was going to be up, and it seems like it's turned into a different thing, man. Like, suddenly you're living down there. Yeah, well, we're What's not living going? down there. We're, What's we're, we're living down there, kind of, but we're going to live down there permanently uh-huh. after everything's all said and done. But right now, we went out there 
to go with our Tim, um, with our friend Tim. And uh, he's a great guy, animal activist. He works with a uh, health force. Um, he's cool. He's got this huge vegan tattoo across his neck. Oh wow! Yeah, he's he's about that life. But um, he uh, we went out there to go visit him and you know work with. He has this thing called uh, Project Awea, and it's a turtle farm, and they save turtles. And cause most turtles, there are ten thousand turtles born, and one of them will survive. Mm-hmm. So they're going extinct. So he does that. He saves turtles. But while we were out there, we met this uh, girl named Alice, and, um, uh, <laughs> Alice, Allie, and uh, she's awesome, great friend of ours. But uh, she goes to the school called uh, Futuro Verde, and it's a you know pretty forward-thinking school in Costa Rica. But um, it's a private school, an IB school, inter baccalaureate school. Mm-hmm. So they're doing very well. But uh, they asked me to do a speech there and talk to them about uh, veganism and what it entails. And um, I went there and I spoke to the kids, like the little baby kids. And that was the most frustrating thing I've ever done. It's so hard to speak to little kids, like first, second grade. It's hard to connect. Yeah, especially you know? about nutrition. They know, like, what's calcium? Yeah, like, it's uh, like you gotta you gotta <laughs> find a way. You gotta find a way in with kids. Yeah, right. That. that, that it's not easy. Yeah, definitely. But then I spoke to the high school kids, uh, you know, uh, the upper grades. And after that, you know, I told them about everything, how natural flavors, what they're really made of. Did you know that the natural flavors, like one of the major ingredients in natural flavor, they derive from beaver butt? So I, ha- I had heard that. I mean, the word natural means nothing. Yeah, it know, means so. absolutely nothing. It's it been basically means it's in, it's in the three-dimensional world. Pretty much. You know? <laughs> yeah. But... uh yeah, so I talked to them about that, talked to them about how I became vegan and, you know, the things that I eat and all that stuff and how they can start transitioning into the vegan diet and how it would be good for them and how it's cheaper to eat a vegan diet as well. That was one of the things that I pitched to them. The next thing I know, the school is like, oh, yeah, you know, we want to um, start. We're, we're impressed by your presentation. We want to start implementing, you know, vegan into our meal plans at the school. And it started with one day we, we pitched to them like a, Meatless Mondays, which is a program that they do out here mm-hmm. in the States, is Meatless Mondays. It works pretty well. But we, we went and talked to them. We told them how you know, they're going to save money doing this. We're saving money uh, having vegan meal plan and, and how it's going to be better for the students and all that stuff. They're doing three days a week now, vegan, wow. uh, vegan menu. And uh, that's pretty good seeing that. That's the, actually, that's the first school in Costa Rica to become vegan. Wow. So... But Costa Rica is a pretty interesting place. I mean, you know, it's incredibly progressive. They have no, <clears throat> they have no like army, right? Like I, they have yeah. like no uh, sort of military yeah. setup, and you know they're on the cutting edge of organic farming. I mean, it's basically like an incredibly vegan, plant-based, friendly place to live. Might be the most on the whole planet. Yeah, it's pretty with the way they function. It's pretty vegan, but at the same time. Um, they're big, like, agri- agriculture people. Like, they're all about, like, where we are is Montezuma, Costa Rica, and the Nicoya Peninsula. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the blue zones. Yeah, one of the blue zones. But it's really, like you said, there's a lot of vegan people out there, but it's not, like you said, there's organic farming, and there's a few vegan people out there. But it's really, like, you know, grass-fed cows and mm-hmm. all that. That's what they're big on right now. Right, because so, that's well, sustainable making, agriculture. Yeah, sustainable yeah. agriculture. But that's what... You know that's what they that's what they make their livelihood on is selling, selling meat, and selling cows, and they're very religious out there. And veganism is comes across as a uh, as a religion. Being vegan comes across as a religion to them out there, and they're, they're like, oh no. But to to have that as a in one in any of the schools in Costa Rica or in Latin America is, is pretty impressive. And the Humane Society International is is involved in it now. And they're helping to re- revamp their menu, and eventually the school is going to go completely vegan, all five days, wow. vegan, which is very impressive. I'm, I'm really thankful for that. And that's awesome. That's pretty cool. That's just like uh, Muse, um, the camera, Susie Cameron, Susie and uh, Susie Amos Cameron, and and her sister Rebecca. <clears throat> Susie's the wife of James Cameron, the film director, mm-hmm. and their school Muse is right on the other side of that hill. Really? They, right I behind you. It. It's pretty cool. You should go and they have a um, thing called Muse Talks. It's kind of like a, 
they do like a TED Talks thing where they bring speakers in to speak. You would you would be great. You should go and you should, you should go and give a talk there. I think I might then, I'm gonna try and hit him up. Oh, you should. I'll I'll, I'll introduce you. Uh, our uh, I gave I did it. Rip Esselstyn's done it. Neil Barnard's been there. They just had Sir Ken Robinson. Like they get some pretty cool people. But you would be great. Awesome. And they're gonna um, they're instituting the first you know all plant based lunch of any school in the country. It starts next year. I mean they already eat. They have plant-based every day, but they have some other options because they just felt like they had to for the parents. But next year, it's full plant-based. They're growing all this food there. It's, it's an amazing place. I'm sure you sent your kids to that school. Well, we've been um, we've homeschooled all our kids. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But our two uh, youngest, our two little girls, they were kind of at a point where it was becoming apparent that, that they could benefit from a little bit more structure. Um and there were certain things that they wanted to explore and they seemed to have an interest in, in checking it out. And like, you know, we've known Susie for a while and we're kind of connected to that school. So it just made sense. So literally just like three or four weeks ago, they, they went there to just kind of go for the end of this year and see how they liked it, but they're enjoying it. I mean, it's amazing. They, it's like solar powered and like <laughs> all this kind of stuff that is like, doesn't exist in any other school. Yeah. It's pretty cool. But, um, I'll make sure that I introduce you to them because you would be cool. You would be great. Appreciate it. But that means, but that means that you can't just go hide out in Costa Rica all the time, right? No, we're coming so what, back out here, man. That's temp- that's like temporary. Yeah. We're just setting up for the future. But uh, but you went down there to here. like go visit some friends, and did you just stay, or did you come back? Have you been kind of going back and forth? Well, we were, we're coming back and forth, but we stayed out there for a pretty long time. It's uh-huh. so amazing. But you know, we can't get any work done in Costa Rica. It's they yeah. don't even have really internet. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, we're coming back out here and. Uh, to LA, this is our hometown, and we're coming back out here to get some work done. And, you know, 300 pound vegan is growing, and we're trying to do some things. So, literally and figuratively, yeah, definitely, right? right? Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. So, but you just need that phone to ring. Yeah, but I'm sure. How's it looking? Right. I mean, do you have any? Do you kind of have a sense of of how it might play out right now? Yeah, it's looking good. Like I said before, I got hurt. I was doing very well, and you know, I had a lot of put up a lot of stats. And, you know, I was impressed with myself. I'm like, oh, man, I'm doing this on a vegan diet. This is great. But uh, I actually was doing better than I was when I first came in and at any time in my career. So, you know, it's just a, right now it's just a waiting game. So we'll see what, we'll see what happens in August when the camp starts. Right. And, and most guys in your position would be working with a trainer every day at a gym, mm-hmm. you know, doing that kind of traditional route. But you're down in Costa Rica doing this kind of primal functional body strength, you know, swinging from trees and carrying, <laughs> carrying rocks around and stuff and like doing pushups on the beach with the 72 year old guy. Right. So how does that work when, you know, you don't have that, that kind of familiar accountability to another person and it's kind of all on you to get up in the morning and, and figure out what you're going to do to, you know, take care of yourself and put you in a position where when you get that call, you're ready to show up and play. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. It makes you, it makes you. You have to be accountable to yourself. Like you don't have, I don't have an accountability accountability partner. I have to get up in the morning and get out there before it gets too hot and work out by myself. And uh, before I left, I work. I sat down with my trainer and my defensive line coach, who I, my pass rush coach, who I work with, and um, I, I worked out a workout plan with the two of them. And, you know, I, had, I got that down before I went out there, but then I started adding my own stuff. But it, it, for, it, for when, I, when you're out there by yourself and you're working out like that by yourself and doing it all by yourself, you have to push yourself. It's a, it's a mental thing. And, you know, like when you're running and you're running 100 miles, <laughs> you know, you have to push yourself. No one's going to do it for you. And uh, that was kind of like a, a, like a crutch that you had when you're working with the trainer. In the states, once you started to slack, somebody would be on your back. Yeah, but when you're doing it, you got to push that weight off your chest by yourself. You know, you got to carry that weight the rest of the way. When I'm carrying that huge bag of rocks or pulling that tree down the, the beach, I have to, I have to do it myself. I have to motivate myself to do it. And you know, it's a, it's physical training, but it's also mental training as well. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, let's get into that part. Uh, I know that like yo- yoga and meditation is kind of a thing that you've gotten into, right? So mm-hmm. how did that start and how has that kind of impacted your perspective? Oh, yoga is awesome. I think it's uh, like it clears the mind. It, it, it fixes the body. It creates space within the body. 
And I sound like a yogi. I'm mm-hmm. not. Yeah, but. dude. That's <laughs> like straight up. You're like unlike any other football player I've ever met. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. No, I mean that's a that's a, that's a good thing, you know. But it's not normal for you know an NFL guy to start you know waxing poetic about like yoga and meditation. Man, it, it should, should be. Yeah, it should. Right? Is like like nutrition should be a very huge thing in sports and nutrition. But we already discussed that. But it's it's not. But uh, yoga, man, it's awesome. It creates space. You get to you you get to know your body. You get to you, you're like having a conversation with your body when you're doing yoga, and you get to go into those deep places. Like mm-hmm. my shoulder, for example, my shoulder injury. Doing all those uh, downward dog stances and and doing all those poses and and stretching and planting my hands into the ground. Um, it was a uh, that stuff opens up your that stuff. It makes you use those muscles that you've never used before. Being a big man. It's hard to get into those poses and the crane poses and stuff at 310 pounds. But uh, it, it really, and that's another mental mental strength thing you got going on right there. It forces you to push yourself to places if you've never been before. Mm-hmm. And where did, it, where did it begin for you? And what was your entry point into yoga? Uh, my beginning point was, uh, shoot, when I first got into the league, Paige made me start doing yoga. Yeah, she, I had a feeling you were going to do that. Yeah, she made, come on, man. I got you know the same I story. I start doing it myself. No, but like where I knew that that's, I had a feeling that's what you were going to say, which yeah. kind of leads me to the next thing that I was going to talk about, which is, you know, the importance of having like a strong, supportive partner who's like pushing you to grow and expand because dude, I mean, left to my own devices, like I'm a jack in the box. You yeah. know what I mean? Like my wife was really, you know, she wasn't fully plant-based. She wasn't fully vegan, but mm-hmm. she was leading a healthy lifestyle and had, <clears throat> you know, healed herself of a cyst in her neck um, using Ayurveda. And she was into yoga and meditation and reading spiritual texts and always kind of like trying to expand her horizons and grow. And, you know, I just wasn't interested, you know, it's like, it took me, I had to get to a place where I was in like a lot of pain in order to start listening. But, but having that partner who's kind of, you know, willing to help and, and standing in their strength, like in the light Mm -hmm. has been transformative for me. Yeah, definitely. And it sounds like you've got definitely have the same thing. Yeah. Definitely taking me to a place where I never even thought about going. Give Paige a mic. She's sitting over there all quiet. All right. All right. All right. (laughs) <laughs> she's good I, I think right but i mean she's you know listen she was the entry point into these nutritional shifts the yeah entry point everything. into yoga yeah same with meditation yeah same with meditation i was like mind racing like i'm not trying to sit down i'd rather sit down and watch television or something or play you know football games or whatever go work out whatever i'm not going to sit there and do nothing for 30 mm-hmm. minutes and just breathe like, okay. <laughs> like, right. And just, like I said, mind racing. But it is, it's amazing how, you know, you, you think that doing a bunch of stuff is probably, I'm, I'm being productive, I'm being productive. No, you, you sit down and you relax and you, you, you know, you think about, you don't even think about anything, but it just, it helps you to grow. And that's the, the easiest way to grow is med- through meditation. I was talking to one of my, my old teammates about it. He's, and, he, and he was like, man, you know, he was like, cause I tell him all the time, bro, you should meditate. You should do yoga. You should, you should, and I'm trying to make him vegan. He's uh-huh. like, he's now he's talking, I'm going to be vegan. But now he's like, you know, um, Hey man, you know, you should meditate. I'm like, man, I'll t- I'm the one that told you that. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh-huh. He's like, and he's telling, he's like, Oh, you should. Yeah. I'm thinking about going vegan. You know that? And I'm like, man, I'm the one that told you that. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, uh, it, it's it's great, man. It, it does a lot of good things for for your mind, for your body, for your soul. And I think it even helps you to heal injuries. You know, just the power of the mind to heal. Power of the mind. Yeah. yeah. Now we're getting all new age. I know, right? Right. How about that? Namaste. <laughs> um, so how does how does that how does that look for you? I mean, what is there a particular type of meditation that you do, or you know, no, I haven't got all into it like that. I just kind of just relax and I just clear my mind. I sit down in my yoga pose and just, mm-hmm. I do it. And it is not just still meditation. When I'm doing my, my yoga, I sit and I meditate or, you know, you meditate anywhere, really. As long as you just sit down, relax and clear your mind and just just get rid of all the world stresses that you have, the day stresses, which you have. Don't think about what you have going on in the future. Don't think about what's troubling you from the past. And just, you know, that stuff, it, it 
it works. It's it's calming, and mm-hmm. that's the best thing. Most people don't get the chance to have that in the day. Right, and and they may think that like, oh well, you're in Costa Rica, you know, I'm stuck on the 405 while you're sitting on the beach, you yeah. know. But the truth is, it's just a choice that you make. Yeah, you do it wherever you, you are. You create your own world. Right. Yeah. But it probably is easier in Costa Rica. It's a lot easier. I'm not <laughs> yeah. going to deny that. Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to deny that. Um, how do you handle... Well, actually, before I get into that, I wanted to ask you, because it kind of follows on the heels of the spiritual aspects of, you know, the the, the things that you're kind of stepping into and growing into, <clears throat> which is the ethical side of, of being vegan. I mean, initially you, you made this switch because you were injured and you wanted a healthier way of, you know, sort of being a football player. Yeah. And now you have a different perspective, or maybe I should say a more expanded perspective because, you know, you're a pretty passionate animal rights advocate and it didn't start out that way. So I'm interested in how that kind of came about. Yeah. Well, definitely. Once I went vegan, it initially was, like you said, just for health reasons. But then uh, when I realized, you know, we don't need meat at all to survive. And I was pushing up big numbers in the gym and running well and, the, and, and put on, had, putting on more weight than I ever had before. Um, you realize that, you know, the only real reason to eat animals, animals is, is for greed, you know. And like you, you know, I remember you said that it's the middleman. You're the middleman. I mean, the animals are the middleman. The animals and we're are stealing the from them. Yeah. yeah, I mean... I think there's this idea that we're that we're uh, obligate omnivores that we must eat meat, and so you know, sort of livestock agriculture is just a necessary thing that we have to do. But once you realize we're not obligate omnivores, it's a choice, and yeah. we can not only survive but actually thrive without them. It's impossible to not go. Well, if that's the case, then like, what are we doing? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's an old. It's an old concept that we need to eat meat. You know, like people who assume that we're, like you said, we're we're carnivores and we're 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 not. You know, like our intestines are not made for it. Or we don't have claws. We don't have large fangs. You know, we can't run down a deer and chase them down. You know, none of that stuff. You know, and so it's it's, it's science, man. Like we're not made to to eat meat at all. And really, you know, the more people find that out, then you know, the better the world's going to be. And I feel that people are just, people are just unaware. And because of that, animals are dying every day by the billions and everything. Like, and it's, it's not just food, it's everything. It's, uh, for example, soap. Most people don't know. They look on that soap is made from, from dogs. Mm. Like, what? Yeah. Wait, I didn't know this. <laughs> yeah. Hold on a second. So that can't be true in the United States. What do you mean made from dogs? Made from dogs, bro. Like, okay. Come on. So, soap. If you look on the back of your soap, there's going to be an ingredient on the back of the soap, glycerin. Glycerin basically is just a scientific term for, okay, this is what they do. All the dogs that are in the dog pound, they get put to sleep. They take them and they got to go somewhere. They're not, they're not, not burning them up, incinerating them or burying them somewhere. They're taking them. They take them to a factory somewhere. They boil them. And they, the fat that comes from the, um, from the dogs and whatever other animals they put in there, cats, dogs, uh, whatever, they just take the fat off, skim it off the top, and they make gl- that's a glycerin. That's the, I didn't know that. They make the soap out of it. So most people don't know that every time they wash their hands, they're putting dead dog fat on their hands. So as, and, it, and it makes you think like, man, what other, what other things are we utilizing animals for that they don't need to be utilized for? Dogs are being put to sleep. And then being caught by the dog pound and they're like finding reasons to kill dogs. You know, I know it's a lot of them, but damn, like, you don't gotta, you don't gotta kill all of them. Yeah. 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 So, and, and so, but where does this, where does this creep in? Is this just a natural evolution of you kind of realizing like, oh wow, I'm actually doing really well yeah. without me. And it just naturally led you to question these paradigms or is yeah. there like a book that you read or, you know, yeah, I mean, this has become like the main part of, who you're all about, what yeah. you're all about. I read the book uh, Mad Cowboy and Meat is for, I read a couple, read a couple of books, Mad Cowboy, where that's the, and Meat is for Pussies and, mm-hmm. and um, uh, I forget the name of the other book, but it's a really good book and it, it talks about all the things that they do that it just, just totally, uh, just not necessary to the animals. For example, animals that we eat, the 
that that they eat, those people that they eat, that you know the pain and the suffering that they go through, and that's totally unnecessary. And when you when you take when you take a step back and you realize that wow, like all this is going on just so I can have a, a steak. You know, they're raping cows to have other cows. Or so have, I can like, have a steak. you know, leather seats in my car or whatever. Yeah, you have, yeah, or, yeah, that's another thing, the death march, where they take the cows and they they march them all the way. They can't kill them in India because they're, like, you know, they're honored. The cows are honored, so they death march them. They across walk them. The, yeah, across the, ba- the boundary line. Yeah, man, that's wild. And just so they can kill them at the end, yeah. And when you realize that all that stuff and how unnecessary it is, especially when we don't need animals to survive in any capacity, it's 2015. We don't need leather seats in our car. We can make a composite leather out of whatever and use that. Or, or not composite, but, you know, we can make... Um, yeah, there's all kinds. I mean, it's 2015. There's a million kinds of modern textiles that you yeah. know, we, we don't really have to use that. We just like the way it smells. Exactly. Know, like the way it feels. We like our steak. It makes us feel regal. You know, that's where that or masculine. I mean, yeah, masculine. you know, masculinity is a big part of this whole thing, too. And, and that's why I think you're such a powerful example, like being a football player and, you know, being a 300 pound guy, you know, because yeah. men associate their sense of identity with these sorts of things, you know, mm-hmm. it's like they got to have their steak because it's not just, it tastes good. That's part of it. But, but there's, there's a, there's a gender identity that comes with that. And, and when you kind of speak to that, it becomes very threatening or, or destabilizing. And it's one thing for like a skinny ultra runner guy to talk about. It's a very different thing for, you know, a guy who can throw up 400 plus pounds on the bench press and is playing in the NFL to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing that, and it does make a difference, you know, like I was talking to somebody about it yesterday and they're like, why do, why do most men feel that they have to be uh, eat meat to be a man? And that is, is true. That's what a lot of guys think. 99% of the men in the world think that. And, you know, they feel like, I don't know, most guys, I don't know, like, I'm a man and there's only protein in here. I got to eat this animal, you know, or get it the blood and it's, you know, yeah, it's the like meat, they're, tearing like they're, the they're meat. being some kind of warrior or something yeah, like some that. Yeah, some carnivore. And like, no, that's not the case. No, you you don't have to eat this innocent animal. First of all, you couldn't go hunt that animal down if you wanted to yourself anyway. Like I said, you don't have the, unless you, if you took away the yeah, gun. going to the Ralphs and they're getting it in cellophane yeah. you know, or the Whole Foods. Yeah, you're not, you're not, <laughs> you're not, you're not hunting. The whole hunter-gatherer concept is out of, you know, that's out the window. You're not doing any of that. You're grocery shopping. But, you know, am I, so you're not really being, that's not really manly. That's, you know, opportunist. Like you're out there, it's convenient to go get the, the meat in the store and you're just feeding whatever, getting eaten whatever somebody tells you. I think part of it also is that, you know, a lot of men feel emasculated because of the way our society is set up. You know, you're stuck in a job you hate. You're sitting in a cubicle. Mm-hmm. Like you're not you're not living the life of like a primal man. Not you know, so it's one way of saying, well, w- at least when I do this, it mm-hmm. makes me feel manly, even if it's a complete illusion or or fallacy. Because mm-hmm. um, it runs deep, man. It's like a it's like a powerful emotional thing. You yeah. know, and it, that's why I think it's so tough for so many dudes to wrap their head around like yeah. the idea of embracing this lifestyle. It's just, it's super scary and threatening because, because they associate it with, with undermining their manhood. Yeah. And yeah. the truth is like real manhood, true masculinity, I think is protect. Yeah. It's being compassionate. It's taking care of, of those that can't take care of themselves. Exactly. Exactly. And not only that, like being around to protect your family, you know, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, like you said, protecting your family. Let's get on that. Well, if you die of a heart attack at fifty and you're not around for, you know, you can't protect your family. <laughs> you're not taking care of them. Exactly. And then not only that, bro. Like, think about this. Like, you know, you have your kids. You have kids. You like, you know, what's in the now? If you were to inform yourself, what goes into what goes into a steak? Like, you have all those antibiotics. You have all those pesticides. You have all those drugs and everything that they pump into the cows, pigs, whatever, and. You cut that up, you go buy it in the store, you cut it up, you put it on a plate, and you feed it to your child. You are not protecting your child. You're harming your child in that sense, you know, your wife in that sense. You're not protecting anybody. You're you're poisoning them. You're allowing big agriculture or whatever, big, the big farm companies or 
you know, all these companies to, to poison your child or your, your, your wife. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So that's not being manly at all, man. That's being, that's being, and I'm not trying to be too aggressive here, but that's being stupid. Right. You know, like. So what do you, how do you address it when you, you, the other guy, the guys that you train with, other football players, dudes you see in the gym who are, you know, probably rolling up on you. Oh, hey man, Dave Carter playing the NFL. Like, oh, you know, oh, vegan, really? Like, well, I'm on a paleo diet. Like, it's working for me. Or, you know, what's wrong with paleo? Because, like, it's all about paleo now. Mm -hmm. It's like the big craze. Yeah, I was trying to create some confusion. So, yeah, like, how do you navigate those conversations? So, I, I tell them, first, like, one of the biggest things that I like to tell them is that, like, man, that's cool, you know, you, you're eating cleaner than... I don't know, you're eating cleaner than a lot of people, but, bro, like, do you understand how the human body is designed? Like, your human body is not designed to eat meat in any capacity. Like, your intestines... Well, those tell you you're, you're wrong about that, Yeah, right? well, like, man, it's science. Look it up. <laughs> like, Google it. Like, the internet is right there at your fingertips. But the it, internet is, is full of all kinds of conflicting, confusing information. It's not always, like this the solution to like google something because yeah. for every study you find you can find a conflicting study and unless yeah. you read the whole thing and figure out who paid for it and mm-hmm. and you have a background in science where you can understand like whatever bias is built into whatever study on either side of the equation then yeah. then you know your whole day's over and you, you know what i mean like you can go down that rabbit hole forever it is it is a challenge to to go against those people who are, they're just so gung-ho about staying on the paleo diet, staying eating meat, they're just, it's like a drug for them, you know, they're trying to find any reason to stay eating meat. But, you know, and I t- I, what I do is I tell them, you know, I tell them about that, how is, scientifically humans are not designed to eat meat, or I read to them the heart disease rates and stroke rates and what, what directly correlated to, to meat consumption and dairy consumption and how... The, for example, the milk company, this is one thing I love to tell, how they're like, I was going, you remember that commercial, the Got Milk commercial? Of course. How could you forget? It's like permanently tattooed on my brain. I yeah. mean, it would be impossible to not know what that was. Exactly. Or, and they're like, milk does a body good and all that stuff. Well, legally, they can no longer say that because they, they crack down on them and there's been studies that have been done and they're like, well, they, they say, oh, milk is good for you. Milk is good for you. Well, legally, no, it's not. <laughs> like, it's, they, they, they can no longer say milk does a body good because it does not. So they can get sued for that. That's false so is that why they, they changed the slogan from milk does a body good to, to protein, got milk? To got, to got milk and protein. And milk has protein in it. Mm-hmm. And so, like, like... You know, people they they don't they don't know about these things because those things are hidden. And milk company do a great job of hiding that stuff. And and like you said, the the meat companies they do a really good job of hiring teams of of researchers to generate false information and 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 false studies to to argue these Harvard studies that have proven that meat it it causes heart attack. It, you know, coagulates the arteries and causes heart attack and stroke and all that stuff. And you know, but you just have to, I like to plant seeds in people's mind and, and tell them like, you know, like, just look for yourself, man, do the research. You know, I've done the research and one of the things is they, they you know, like, you can see that you can, by looking at me that, you know, you're not going to get weak and small by being a vegan. So let that be enough, man. And do some research and watch some documentaries and, and find out for yourself and, and don't just listen to what anybody's just telling you. Do your own research and, and, and be your own, your own nutritionist and be your own scientist because, like, every time you eating is one of the things that you do most times a day. Most people eat three times a day. What else are you doing three times a day? Mm-hmm. Nothing. People don't shower three times a day. You know, none of that stuff. So it's like at least be aware of what it is that you're doing the most time, most of your life. You know, don't just allow, don't just let it be anything that you're putting in down your mouth or feeding to your kids or feeding to your pregnant wife, whatever. Yeah. Educate yourself, like yeah. invest yourself in what that's all about and connect yourself more closely to the food choices that you're making for yeah. yourself and for your kids. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I think for you, uh, the most powerful thing that you can do and the most powerful way for you to carry the message is just to keep getting stronger. And, and, and play your ass off on the field. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Because especially for dudes, it's like yeah. it's what you do 
you know, is going to trump whatever's coming out of your mouth. It's yeah. almost like if you do that, it doesn't matter what you're, it, you, you don't have to say anything. Yeah. You definitely. know, because everyone gets it. Yeah. You know, so I want to see you kicking some ass. Thanks, man. I'm, I'm going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So, well, I think that's a beautiful way to, to wrap it up and close it down. But, but I think, you know, one thing I'd like to leave people with is, you know, maybe some, some tips or, or some inspiration for somebody who's listening to this and they're new to these ideas, you know, and, and they're interested, they're intrigued. They're like, wow, I never would have thought like a dude in the NFL, like really? And so maybe they're ready to, you know, kind of dip their toe in the water. Like where, where, where would you, or where do you suggest, you know, people make that first step? How do you do that? Well, uh, I mean, you're, you were an all in dude. Like I kind of was a little bit too, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, yeah, you, I started you like flick that switch and it's over with, but most people aren't like that. Yeah. I started like, like you said, all in the next day, but, um, it's hard for a lot of people to, to, to go vegan because first they don't even know where to begin. And, um, you know, uh, you know, the best way to do is to look up some, look, start researching and look up some, you don't really have to look far. Look on, look on the internet and look up some recipes and find some creative recipes, something easy, something simple that you can, uh, that you can make really quickly. And, you know, it's not a huge hassle. And, you know, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm working with this company. It's called, it's called Lighter. And we're and we're creating it's lighter and it's a it's a group that the the nutritionist is actually a runner, mm. a marathon runner, and she's uh we're we're working together to create heavier, which is which is my half of lighter, uh-huh. but <laughs> it's pretty cool, right? So oh no, it's not heavier, it's stronger. That was the first name, right. it's stronger, but it's, yeah, it's heavier as kind of a negative. Most people yeah, don't want to get they don't heavier. want heavier. Yeah, yeah. No, it's stronger, but um, it's an awesome. It's an awesome concept. It's really like, you know, it's a personal nutritionist and they do all the shopping for you basically and bring it to your front door. It's like an app? Is it's, that what you're talking about? It's a website uh-huh. and it's okay. called uh, Lighter and LighterCulture.com. LighterCulture.com. And okay. yeah, it's pretty awesome, man. Great stuff. And they do the best job to get as close to non-GMO as possible. They follow the, the, the big, is it called the big nines? The dirty dozens. Oh, dirty dozens. The yeah. dirty dozens, and um, it's 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 awesome, awesome. They do they get great products and all that stuff, and they have recipes, and a lot of my recipes are up there, and what I do to and my weight gaining recipes, and what I do for pre workout, after workout, and all that stuff. So mm-hmm. it's awesome, but um, that's one option. But then you know, uh, going on going online and looking up, uh, there's another great website. It's uh oshiglows.com they have great recipes that's one of the mm-hmm. websites that got me started and it's it's, it's very Angela easy Lippen. yeah yeah she's awesome that's cool. but um yeah there's it, there's plenty of vegan options like i said i'm not a big fan of the processed foods but there's huge process there's 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 um gardein and and um, beyond meat beyond and meat is awesome beyond they have great great food beyond eggs just mayo like, i love just mayo <clears throat> yeah i mean so for somebody who's not ready to let go of of those, like for you and me, it's like I don't it's think not about problem. that stuff anymore. But like most people, like uh, they just you know they they need to transition. So yeah. those foods have their place for that. But I think I, I think people overcomplicated in their mind because they don't they don't know right. So they think it's going to be hard or you know, cardboard all these foods. Yeah, or, or all this meal prep. They're going to have to you know spend all day because spend all day in the kitchen creating these recipes because the idea is like oh you're trying to recreate. Uh, something that tastes like meat and dairy, but yeah. it's not about that. No. You know, it's so simple. It's like, look, we're sitting here, we're eating, a, we're eating a bowl of blueberries. Yeah. Did we have to prepare that? No, it's you already know? made. Man. I got a big bag of almonds over there and some bananas, and a big bag of rice and a big bag of beans. And like, if all you did was go to the store and buy a bag of rice and beans, you're good. That's a like, meal. That's huge. That's a that's a huge start. Yeah. You know, make a big thing of rice and a big thing of beans and put it in your, your refrigerator and then you can eat for a week. Yeah, just add some yeah. add some simple things, avocado, tomato, and you're good. And that's a that's a full on delicious meal right mm-hmm. there. I love it. That's my one of my favorites. But yeah, but a lot of people make it a lot harder than what it is. And like we said earlier, that's probably the meat um, companies uh adding all these extras to it and hyping it, making it something that is not, but it's very easy and it's very inexpensive. So. Yeah. Yeah. And 
I mean, it's it's not just the meat companies. It's it's cultural, you know. Cultural. There's just, this is there's just this hardened idea that this is what it is, and so, you know, it's people like you that are that are you know changing that perspective. So, uh, thank you for that, man. Thank you, bro. Appreciate yeah, it. You're an inspiration. I can't wait for you to get that phone call. I want to see what you're going to be doing next year, and uh, I'm excited for you, man. Thank you, bro. And been... I want to come down and visit you guys in Costa Rica. Oh, you should. You were <laughs> supposed to, and then we ended up coming down here. So. I know. <laughs> like, we got to make that happen somehow. I'd love to do that. I've, uh, my friend Charlie Knowles is going to be moving down there soon. Yeah. He's a meditation teacher. I should connect you to him, too. Oh, nice. I nice. don't know what part of Costa Rica it is, but... Anyway. Probably where we are. That's like the the is big it? hippie zone where we're living. Right oh, now. it is. Yeah. I thought the whole country was a big hippie zone. It, ours is like the concentration of hippies where we are right there. Is it? Yeah. All right, man. Yeah, I like it. Thanks. A hippie in the NFL. Got to do it, man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, uh, thanks for dropping by. All the kind of books and references that we made throughout this conversation will be in the show notes uh, on the episode page at ritual dot com for this episode. So go there and check that out and dig in and, uh, you know, pull that thread and go on your own journey with all this stuff, man. Right. All right. Cool. I think we did it. Yeah. How do you feel? Feel good? That was good, man. You know, Hey, this is a good interview. You have to have me back on (laughs) once I get time. Anytime, man. Anytime. I would love to have you back on. I'd love to have you back on, uh, after, you know, you're back and playing and come and share, you know, what that's all about and what that, what's that like? All right. You do that? No problem, man. Cool, man. All All right. right. Peace. Peace. Plants. Plants.